King Student Association panel on Pride Talks for Pride Week. Um, so I am going to be your host or lovely uh, MC, and we have three panelists today, Dr. Carolyn Leifers, Dr. Heather Loy, and Dr. Neil DeRue. That is the order that they're going to be talking in. So what we're going to, what's going to look like, just so you know how we're doing this, Dr. Leifers is going to talk, and then Dr. Loy is going to give her talk, and then Dr. DeRue is going to give his talk. And then we're going to open it up after that for questions and discussions and for the panelists to engage with each other, each other's uh, talks, and um, for you also to ask your questions and that kind of thing. So I'm not sure the best, we don't have a roving mic or anything, so maybe if you just put your hand up and I'll indicate to you, make eye contact with you for when your question is, uh, when you can ask your question, okay? All right, so with that, Dr. Leifers. Oh. Thank you all very much. And thanks for this opportunity to speak on what I think is a really important topic. So really pleased to be here today. So I'm just going to basically do a very quick history of pride, about 10 minutes history of pride. So apologies for the fact that this is going to be a bit of a whirlwind. If you know anything about the history of pride, you might know something like it started at Stonewall or after Stonewall or something like that. <laughs> and I am here to basically give you a little bit of the history of not only Stonewall, but also a little bit of what came before and what came after. So putting this in a larger context. If we were to go back in our time machines to the 1950s, we would be encountering environments both in the United States and Canada that was both implicitly and sometimes even explicitly quite hostile to gender and sexual minorities. And I have here just a few bullet points summarizing some of the reasons that people felt the need to march. Homosexual activity was illegal in most US states and in Canada. Cross-dressing was also criminalized. Homosexuality was also somewhat paradoxically not only criminalized, but also simultaneously considered a mental illness until it was removed from the uh, APA's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual in 1973. Gay people were commonly fired from jobs and were explicitly barred from working in the US federal government starting in 1953. And in Canada, they were commonly fired or pressured to resign from government jobs because they were deemed a security risk. Gay people were not permitted to participate in the armed forces, and gay couples could not often be beside loved ones in hospital, get mortgages or insurance together, share health benefits, and their wills could be contested. Gay people were also prohibited from immigrating to Canada and the US. So a lot of various reasons that people felt the need to push for more civil rights. And you do see some of this push beginning with some very quiet, very staid marches and pickets in the mid 1960s. There was one at the White House in April of 1965, for example, as people marched for civil rights. And this is one in Philadelphia. Philadelphia had a regular annual event every year on the 4th of July. It was known as the annual reminder. And this is the annual reminder to, of course, pay attention to the issue of LGBT civil rights demands. The first one was in 1965, 39 people showed up and they were explicitly asked to wear jackets and ties for men and dresses for women. The goal was to represent the community as quote, presentable and employable. So this is what these early marches looked like. But what historians identify as this early stage in the uh, push for gay rights was actually beginning to pivot into a more radical movement for gay liberation as we move into the late 1960s. And you can see that paralleled in other movements as well. The civil rights movement turns into black power, right? Black liberation. You see this in the feminist movement that turns toward women's liberation. And you see things like the Vietnam War turning people's uh, attention to the fact that perhaps they don't really feel the same confidence in previous institutions and authority figures that they once did. So this is part of a larger kind of sea change in American and Canadian life. And this takes us to Stonewall. You may know a little bit about Stonewall. This was an inn, a bar effectively, in New York City in Greenwich Village that was friendly to the LGBTQ community. It was actually owned by the mafia who typically paid the police to look the other way while they sold liquor illegally without a license. 
But something in that relationship broke down in the summer of 1969, and the police carried out a raid on the Stonewall Inn. Ostensibly, their reason was that Stonewall was selling liquor without a license, but they also did not miss an opportunity to arrest people for offenses like gross indecency or masquerading, which is wearing the clothing of the opposite sex or gender. What was unique about Stonewall, though, was what you see here, people pushing back. There had been a few smaller incidents like this where people had pushed back against authority figures in the cases of these raids, but Stonewall was a particularly big one, a particularly visible one, and it got the attention of the media. And it also heralded really a new phase in this movement of gay liberation. This lasted several nights, and as you can see, the New York Daily News, as well as many other media establishments, covered this. So how does this turn in to the thing we know as Pride today? Well, one year later, so June of 1970, various gay liberation communities in New York City, but also parallel movements in San Francisco, LA, Chicago, decided to get together and commemorate the one year anniversary at what, of what had happened at Stonewall. They called this Christopher Street Liberation Day. Christopher Street is the street where the Stonewall Inn was located. And they marched in a parade, a, 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 a protest, if you will, in New York City. And as I said before, parallel ones in other cities as well. And the word that was often used was gay liberation, but you can also see here the word pride is surfacing in their um, images, in their posters, in their uh, signs that they're carrying. You may be curious to know about the position of the Christian communities in all of this. And obviously there was a lot of diversity, many different Christian denominations, different Christian positions on this matter. But I do want to introduce you to the guy on the left here. His name is Troy Perry. And he was actually the founder of the Metropolitan Community Church. He founded this church in 1968. Specifically, he said, God wanted me to start a new church that would reach into the gay community, but that would include anyone and everyone who believed in the true spirit of God's love, peace, and forgiveness. He was based in Los Angeles, and he actually was one of the lead organizers for Los Angeles' event in 1970. He had to apply, of course, for a license from the police commission to hold a march. They threw up a lot of barriers to try to make that difficult for him. He had to take them to court and ultimately prevail. So they were able to hold this march in Los Angeles in parallel with the one that was going on in New York a year after Stonewall. Now we've been focusing a lot on the US, so you're probably curious about Canada as well. Well, Canada is on a bit of a different trajectory. But there were a few notable movements. So in the early 1970s, this is in August on a very rainy day, about 100 people marched on Parliament Hill to specifically demand uh, attention to issues of discrimination against the LGBTQ community. And in August of 1973, we saw simultaneous events occurring across a number of different Canadian cities. Some of these involved marches, but they also were dances, picnics, documentary screenings, and other events associated with raising awareness around LGBTQ issues. And uh, Edmonton also had its own events as well. They arrived a little more slowly compared to cities like Toronto or Montreal, but Edmonton's first gay pride festivities are reported to have occurred in 1980. There was apparently a picnic and a baseball game. And then in 1982 is the first Pride weekend in Edmonton. There's actually no march in that 1982 Pride weekend, but there was a baseball tournament, a dance, and a barbecue, which sounds like a pretty fun weekend. There's a wonderful historian named Valerie Kornick who wrote a book called Prairie Fairies. It's all about LGBTQ history on the prairies. And she says that Edmonton tended to be more cautious about activism than other cities, but it was, quote, political when provoked. And that 1982 weekend that I mentioned, the first Pride weekend, was actually a, a reaction to the Pisces bathhouse raid that had occurred one year earlier in Edmonton in 1981. And it left many members of the community feeling hurt and uh, worried about authority. Edmonton begins regular pride marches, which you can see one here from 1993 in the early 1990s. And the last slide I have is about what's happening today. 
Well, you probably all know more or less the issues of Pride today. I mean, we're here, of course, uh, for Pride Week, but there is always ongoing controversy. Some feel Pride has become too corporate as big businesses participate and are um, basically getting in the way of or perhaps obscuring issues like homeless youth, right, which continue to sort of be pushed to the side. Some people feel that pride has lost sight of its liberation roots when police officers participate. That's a common uh, debate. Some feel pride can be too R-rated and seemingly confirms what can be sometimes harmful stereotypes. And some feel pride needs to pay more attention to the particular struggles that racialized and or colonized people experience. So these are ongoing conversations. If there's anything that this history tells us, it's that pride has seldom looked the same in different communities at different moments in time in different places. And indeed, we here at King's are probably in a moment of figuring out what pride is going to look like for us as well. So we're part of a, a long history of working these things out. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. I have a little, little bitty voice, so I'm going to uh, take off my mask because I'm far enough away from you. Hopefully I don't um, affect you. Um, okay, thanks, Caroline. That was actually really helpful. I didn't know a lot of those details either. Um, so my focus is more um, uh, in the present and maybe a little bit more individual. Uh, and so speaking as a psychologist, uh, so pride in general is about uh, ce celebrating and uh, making visible the existence, the resilience, and the achievements of people who identify as sexual or gender minorities. So whether you think sexual or gender minority identities are signs of disability or signs of healthy human diversity, uh, I'm presuming in these brief comments that we all agree that all human beings need to be treated with dignity respect, grace, and inclusion, that causing suffering and exclusion of anyone is to be repented and avoided. So how do we achieve that? We human beings are frighteningly good at exclusion. We are a tribal species, and we tend to treat difference as a potential threat as opposed to a potential opportunity. There are many things we use as a basis for exclusion and hostility, including weight, ability, religion, race, ethnicity, sexuality, and gender expression, among others. But simply asserting that we ought not to automatically treat difference as a threat, and that we ought to recognize that each person we encounter is made in the image of God, that they have equal worth, isn't actually good enough. In my own research, I've heard um, repeatedly many, a very well-meaning person say something like, I treat everyone as a child of God. That's the only identity that matters. That's a really good place to begin, except for the but that usually follows that comment. But I don't see why they have to flaunt their sexuality. Why can't they keep it private? But I don't see why people with sexual or gender minority identities need special treatment. Unfortunately, this generic approach, this plan to treat everyone well, in reality, it rarely translates into meaningful inclusion and relationship. So why not? Why isn't it good enough to just be nice to everybody? And it's because being nice to others, even those different from me, is way too vague and general and objective. So psychologists will tell you that if you want to enact real change, your goals have to be concrete and, 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 and specific. They, you, you can't just deal with abstractions. Um, so none of us can simply love everyone. And so we have to ask, who is included in my everyone? And what does it look like to love them? Wendell Berry reminds us, and this is a paraphrase from his writing, we only love those who we particularly know. We need the language of familiarity, reverence, and affection by which things and people of value are ultimately protected. In other words, we cannot be generically nice people. So to make things concrete then, 
to more clearly define who is this everyone that I need to love, I need to learn about and work to change the specific structures and practices that make those in a vulnerable minority invisible and wounded. Researchers are exploring what those are for sexual and gender minority persons. So they include things like, and this is not a complete list, by the way, communities and narratives that remain primarily focused on simple distinctions and stereotypes about being female or male, woman or man. A lack of maps and models for life journeys that might not involve heterosexual relationships, marriage and childbearing. Explicit and implicit condemnation or at best pity for those who do not fit the majority narrative around sexuality or gender expression. Risks of rejection, harassment, bullying, violence, and more subtly but equally damaging risks of being less likely to be hired, promoted, taken seriously in one's career. Risks of exclusion, risks of being treated as broken, someone who needs pity and fixing as opposed to someone who can fully participate in and contribute to our communities. And there's the strong perception that Christian communities in particular are unsafe places to be for those who identify as sexual and gender minorities. So the consequences of this and a whole host of other um, structures and processes and social values and, and, and so on, um, the consequences of this are well documented. Sexual and gender minority people are two to three times and sometimes more than that, more likely to experience low levels of social support from family and friends, peers and coworkers, teachers and employers. They feel the need to hide their sexual or gender identity for fear of the consequences with family, friends, and also in the workplace. Reluctant to report microaggressions or even overt bullying and violence. Experiencing social isolation and loneliness. Feeling generally unsafe. Losing their faith and their faith community. Experiencing mental illness like depression, anxiety, addiction, and self-harm. Have lower academic achievement. It's really hard to focus on your studies when you're focusing all the time on the stresses, the other stresses that you're uh, carrying. And experiencing shame and self-loathing, a sense that I am broken and I cannot be fixed. When everybody around you suggests that, that you are, it's pretty hard to not believe it for yourself. This suffering and shame is not inherently part of having a minority sexual or gender identity. It occurs because of the context in which you are experiencing that identity. It isn't easy to change a context, to change the unconscious assumptions and shared stories of what it means to be gendered and sexual. But the place to start is with becoming aware in specific and concrete terms of the lived experiences of the minorities in this particular context that, we're, that we share. And to do that, we need to know them in their uniqueness, their particular needs, which means we need to see them first. And so we need pride. We need safe spaces like Speak at King's, we need to pay attention to these things because what pride does, all controversies you know, acknowledged, is that it makes visible. And the making visible is not so people who identify as sexual gender minorities you know, um, uh, can see each other because they usually find each other somehow. It, I mean, it helps. But the making visible is making visible to those who aren't sexual and gender minorities to say, we are here. Please notice us, listen to us. So by paying attention to pride, by engaging pride, by viewing it as an invitation to a conversation, we take the first steps to making concrete change in how these particular minorities are treated. And the principle of course applies to people who have other kinds of minority identities as well. But that's not the topic for this conversation. So, um, but, uh, but 
to understand, and this is the answer that I always want to give when people say, you know, why do people of sexual gender minority need special attention? Everybody needs special attention. Everybody's special. It's a little bit like the same answer you give when people say, well, you don't have to say Black lives matter. All lives matter. The trouble is that as soon as you say that, then you've completely denied all the structural and um, unconscious and subtle ways in which we throw up obstacles for other people. And most of us aren't doing it on purpose. But until we learn that we are doing it unintentionally, we can't fix it. And that's all that I have to say. I'm also going to take my mask off if that's okay with everyone. Stand back. <laughs> Far enough away from Caroline. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, sort of stepping back a little bit bigger picture from the, the Pride conversation. So I'm going to be talking about sort of a renewed understanding of Christian sexuality or of sexuality in Christian communities. Okay, so it's a bit of a bigger picture question. Um, <clears throat> so the American musician Butch Hancock has said that what he learned growing up in the Bible Belt is that sex is the most awful, filthy, and disgusting thing on earth, so you should save it for someone you love. <laughs> now, while most people probably don't say it quite that explicitly, that is actually a really common understanding of sexuality among contemporary Christians, right? Sex is bad, it's dirty, it's a temptation from the devil, but also something you should save for the person you love the most, right? These kind of absurd and contradictory statements just reveal that as Christians, we don't really know what we're supposed to think about sex or how to talk about it, right? Do we? Right now, our Christian understanding of, of sexuality seems to boil down to simply one rule, no sex before marriage. That's it. That declaration is absolutely lacking in any kind of depth or meaningfulness, right? There are never reasons about why this rule has to be followed. It's simply, this must not be done. And that's it. But regulating particular sex acts is not the same thing as having a view of sexuality, right? So it's by sex acts, sex acts are just particular actions people do for the purposes of sexual gratification, that usually, but not always, involve genital stimulation, leading towards, although not always achieving, orgasm. Sexuality, on the other hand, is a particular form of creating and expressing intimacy and connection through our physical bodies. So whether I find someone sexy or hot or just cute, for example, or the ways that I might, okay, I might not, the ways that someone might play with their hair, or get embarrassed and flushed when around someone that they're attracted to. These are both examples of sexuality that have nothing to do with particular sex acts. And since sexuality, including sexual desire, is something designed and given to us by God, there must be a way to do it well. And I think focusing on that question is a much more appropriate way to think about Christian sexuality, or for Christians to think about sexuality, than merely regulating who can do what particular sex acts with whom. If we focus exclusively on sex acts, so again, telling people to just avoid sex, don't have intercourse before you're married, um, if that's all we focus on, we separate sexuality from any sense of intimacy or connection. And on this point, I think the sort of no kissing until marriage movement is as guilty of this as is sort of contemporary hookup culture. Right? Both of them have separated sex acts entirely from anything like intimacy or emotional connection. And so separating sex acts from, from intimacy in turn makes it much more difficult to develop positive and healthy sexualities. Okay? It, it's not like, right, in Christianity, we have this sort of myth that like somehow you get married and you just flip the switch and now everything that was not okay is okay, right? But it's not how anybody works, right? Your thoughts about sex, right? Your, your, your hangups, your turn-ons, your baggage, your whatever, all that stuff that you had before you got married, it doesn't disappear when you say I do. It's still there. 
right? It stays with you. And so people who are raised to think of sex as bad, as dirty, as sort of some kind of, of, of sexual desire, some kind of devilish temptation that needs to be conquered, people raised to think that way tend to judge either themselves or their partner for the sex that they want to have. They tend to feel shame about the sex that they have. They tend to be uncomfortable sharing their own sexual desires, even with their partner, right? If it's dirty to think about or have it, how much harder is it to talk about it with somebody, right? And because they don't share their own sexual desires with their partner, they tend to end up either unfulfilled or looking to pornography or other outlets to find to try to sort of get their desires met. And just more generally, people raised to think that way about sex generally find it quite difficult to connect sex acts with a real sense of shared intimacy. Sex becomes a need to be met or a duty to be discharged, something that, you know, I'll trade that. If you do the dishes, we can have sex later, right? Like something to sort of be exchanged in household chores, um, rather than a sight of sort of two becoming one flesh. And many married Christian couples have struggled with these things for years, even decades before they find their way to something like a healthy expression of their sexuality. And many other Christian couples simply never find their way to healthy expressions of Christian sexuality. And so I would suggest that our focus as Christians should shift away from just preventing young people from having sex and towards helping people enjoy healthy, God-honoring expressions of their sexuality. And for this to happen, I think we have to embrace the fact that as humans, we really want to connect with others in a variety of ways, right? Emotionally, socially, physically, sexually, but there's more. Right? And I think drawing a parallel between emotional intimacy and sexual intimacy can be helpful here, right? We all have different levels of intimacy with people. Right? You have best friends, you have good friends, you have work friends, you have buddies, you have acquaintances, right? You have all kinds of different levels, right? And we're all okay with that, emotionally speaking. We all know how to share ourselves differently with best friends than we do with buddies, right? This is something that all of us know how to do. Different levels of intimacy just sort of naturally lead to different expressions of that intimacy, right? Sometimes you become more intimate with people over time, but sometimes you don't, right? Sometimes someone starts as a buddy and becomes a best friend, but it's also totally appropriate to like someone and just stay buddies with them. That's all it's ever gonna be. And that's fine too. So why not think about sexuality the same way? Right, as something that we do with multiple people express expressing multiple levels of intimacy. Right? There will be people whose attraction we appreciate simply from afar. Maybe there'll be other people with whom we sort of flirt with verbally, others we interact with sort of more physically, maybe you do that like arm touch thing that people do, that's so fun. Um, <laughs> right? Others we share hugs with, others we kiss, some on the cheek, some on the mouth, some with tongue, some without, right? You get it. like there's different levels of how we can express and how we can show that. And like with emotional intimacy, not everyone I flirt with, not everyone I am sexual with has to be my forever after. But also, if all I ever have is superficial sex partners, then also I'm going to miss out on, on the wide scope of what sexual intimacy can be, right? Just like with emotional intimacy. If all I ever have is buddies and I never have any actual real friends, I'm really missing out on something, right? And I think this is why so many young people find hookup culture ultimately to be unfulfilling. Right? At least as, as a sort of a holistic picture of their sex life. Right? It's, fi it's fine. It's fine sometimes on a Friday night to hook up with someone. Like, it's okay from time to time. But if that's all you have, you're missing something of that intimacy or that connection that we as, that we as human beings crave. And because sexuality is a form of intimacy and connection, therefore different levels of sexual intimacy are just part of what it means to be a sexual being. Right? We use our physicality to express different levels of intimacy that we have with different people. We, we don't have to try to confine the entirety of our sexual lives only to one person, nor should we express our sexuality in the same ways, no matter what kind of relationship or how well we know someone. Right? Trying to have sex 
with every person you're attracted to is a super weird way to be sexual, <laughs> right? Just like trying to be best friends with everyone you meet is a super weird way to be social, right? We just don't do that. Well, we shouldn't do that, even though sometimes we do. Um, right? Instead, what I'm saying is we should celebrate the full range of sexual expressions with creativity, with fun, and with playfulness, just like we do with emotional intimacy, but also with trust and with consent, right? And, and I want to remember sort of, Consent is not just permission to touch someone else's body. I mean, it should include that if you're going to touch someone else's body, if you're going to engage in sort of physical sexual connection with other people, you should get their consent first, but that's not the whole of it, right? Consent is also, and maybe more, more deeply, it's permission to be intimate and vulnerable with someone, right? To open yourself, to share yourself with someone in some particular way. So I shouldn't foist my sexuality on others who don't want it any more than that random guy on the bus should foist his emotional problems on everyone he meets, whether they want it or not, right? So let me end by asking you a question. Okay, first, two questions. How many of you grew up Christian? I just sort of quick show of hands. Okay, so okay, so most of you, that's okay, that's interesting. Um, okay, so those of you who did grow up Christian, then how many of you have ever had a real, meaningful, and honest conversation about sex with an adult, let's say with someone from a different generation. So if you're already an adult with a younger person, right? I, I, before you answer, I don't mean like a simplistic conversation where like, don't have sex till you're married or like girls cover those up or something like that. I mean like a real conversation, right? Like a, where you talk about what healthy, good and God honoring sex looks like. How many of you have had that conversation with an adult? Right. That's actually much, much better than I expected. <laughs> Mostly when I talk about this with groups, like there's if I have 30 people, like one or two have had an actual conversation about sex, right? And I find that really troubling, right? As a people, as a community that sort of says one generation should tell the next about the wondrous deeds of the Lord, we just really fail to do that when it comes to sexuality in any way, shape, or form, right? We just don't. And so here's my proposal. Instead of trying to dictate what sex acts everyone can or cannot engage in, because frankly, it's kind of creepy to spend so much time thinking about what other people are doing with their genitals anyway, right? So let's just put all that away. And instead of doing that, I'd encourage us all instead to just start some meaningful conversations with people that we know and trust about what healthy, flourishing, there's a good King's word for you, sexual lives would look like. Right? That strikes me as a much, much better way to develop a genuinely Christian understanding of sexuality. Thanks. All right, I'll invite the panelists to come up. Think of your questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That was really interesting and very diverse range of topics within <laughs> the sort of Students Association Pride Talks panel. All right, so first of all, I'll open it up to the audience. Does anyone have any questions? It can be either for a specific talk or it can be directed at the panel. Um, it's your choice. Yeah, go for it. I want to give students a chance first, but... Um, I guess my question is mostly for Heather, but kind of for all of you. Um, I am aware, speaking of making things visible, I am aware of very direct actions of bullying and intimidation and horrible behavior um, that happens towards a lot of our students who are sexual and gender minorities. Is there anything systemically you think kings could do immediately to address that? Hmm. That's a really I mean, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, I would not look for sharing that if I were a student, but I am aware of it. So mm -hmm. I'm going to say it happens here. Right. And I just want to make that visible. And I guess I, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, I would like your talk to be required at organization. <laughs> you know, but anyway, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is to make it visible. You just 
made it visible by speaking it. Um, I mean, I'm not good at like the public, you know, poster campaign thing or whatever it is, but I mean, maybe we just need to make it visible. Like we actually, like don't make the people who have the experience tell the stories, but have a safe person gather the stories. And, um, and maybe, you know, we need a poster that goes up on the wall or something that goes on the screen that says, this happened um, and it's not okay. And, and, and just like not, to, but not in a depressing way, but in a way that provides a, um, a positive alternative. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> if you do that, we are going to come and get you. <laughs> <laughs> but but I I would turn to people with way more wisdom than I have about exactly how you would go about effective actually. I know that there's lots of schools have um, have over the last couple of decades developed like pretty good anti-bullying programs, and the research is suggesting that rates of bullying are going down. They're going down for everybody. They're going down more slowly for sexual gender minority students than for. Um, the, uh, you know, that for students in general, but they are going down everywhere and those programs are being given the credit for it. So if we could learn something from those, that would be, yeah. And I, I do think, or at least I hope um, that that part of, part of the, a very different part of it, but part of it is, is having these conversations, like learning to laugh at how messed up sort of Christian sexuality or normal Christian sexuality or whatever the heck that is, right? <laughs> I mean, I think all of that has to be part of it too, right? Because part of what, what makes, um, okay, it's only a part of it, but part of what makes sexual minorities and gender minorities sort of such a, a topic of bullying, a place that sort of slowed down is because we have, yeah. we're so uncomfortable around all of our own sexuality that, yeah. that it's like, here's a place we can sort of do something with that, right? When there's like much better ways and things to do with some of that sexual attention and sexual energy uh, that are much more productive and healthy and, and and God honoring than making other people feel like shit, right? Mm -hmm. That's not a good way to do that. Yeah. yeah, I'd echo what my two co-panelists have just said. I agree, this is a place ultimately for learning and for growth. And I really do believe that as sort of Heather says, just talking about it, drawing people's attention to these issues, uh, letting people know that you know there is a, a human behind whatever stereotype or idea or preconception or whatever you have about a particular gender or sexual minority makes a massive difference, mm -hmm. right? And uh, that's something that I think we could do in a lot of our different classes is, you know, to introduce people along, our students along the way, right, mm -hmm. to individuals who have lived these lives, lived these truths, and try to understand the world from their perspective a little bit more. And that doesn't always mean 100% agreeing with everything that they have done with their lives or beliefs or what have you but it's about restoring the humanity mm -hmm. behind the preconceptions. Thank you. Is that a hand? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's connected to the way of the um, After a while, I think you just kind of uh, blur out or forget all of the things people have said to you or your friends. Um, after a while, um, what are we supposed to do about people who think or base their sexuality and their lives and how they feel about other people's sexuality and their sex acts based on certain things in the Bible. And then they think they have a responsibility and the authority to say certain things and do certain things to people. I mean, do I have to do Everyone's looking at me. <laughs> I'll look at you, Neil. Uh, uh, I looked at you because you talked about the Yeah, the I mean, so I don't have, if I had a better answer, like I'd be doing it already, I think, but um, I feel like, part, I, and again, I think part of that answer just has to be like getting people to see, we don't have a Christian view of sexuality. There is no meaningful Christian view of sexuality. Right? Like, and I, again, I hear a lot of um, sort of, some groups of Christians sort of talking about the, the, the like, what are we going to do about homosexuality? Because that's the word that they still like to use for it sometimes. Um, and I was like, you know, before you answer that question, how about you just figure out what you want to do with sexuality? Yeah. And then we can talk yeah, about different variations on that, yeah. right? Like, and you're trying to tell me what to do. Right, yeah. Like, if you don't, right, like, and, and for me, that's the big, that's, that's the big, like, we have to step back and have that bigger conversation. Right? Now, that doesn't help in the immediate sense of protecting people and stuff. 
space. But and right. Them that they're not looking at me from a different point. Yeah. They're in the same spot. Exactly. And my hope is if we can develop sort of positive accounts of like what se sexuality is about connecting with emotionally with people by a sort of certain physical yeah. means, right? If that's what it is in healthy ways, right? And then we can talk about what are healthy ways. Once we have a positive account, then we have something to talk meaningfully about, about could this particular sex act lead us in that direction or not? Does it, who's engaging in those sex acts? Is it possible that people of the same gender could engage in those ways that would still lead to those positive productive outcomes, right? All that becomes possible when you have criteria or something like a, a reason that you're shooting, something that you're aiming for, right? Some healthy vision you're aiming for. When your whole vision is just like, who can do what when with whom? And you don't know, and you don't know why that's the case, right? Like you don't know what why why does marriage make a difference? I don't know because it says it in the Bible, except it doesn't actually say that anywhere in the Bible. That's not in the Bible anywhere. Um, so it's not a thing, right? But you have no account of that, you have no notion of that, and so then you can't defend it, and then all you but but that's all you know. So you have to cling to that all the harder because you don't know why it's there, right? Right. Yeah. It, you have no grounds to stand on. And so all you can do is like lash out when you feel uncomfortable, which is what happens to people. Right. And so a part of it, I, I want like part of it, there are deeper issues with Christian sexuality that, that hopefully, at least my hope is addressing those will help address some of these issues that you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And and I mean, this person, I do think this is a big part of the reason why I think it was Carolyn. You were mentioning how people are like, I don't know why they have to be like so forward with their sexuality all the time, right? And I was like, you're just jealous. <laughs> like the problem is, is because you want to do that, but you have no idea how. Right? You want to be able to like flirt with someone. So but like you're not allowed, you can't even be in the same room as a member of the opposite gender, and you're like you you can't you don't know how to do this, right? Right, like, and that's I think that part of it is just like if we have to demystify the whole thing, right? It's so much is just all these rules that nobody understands, and all it just make, it makes everything so interesting and intriguing, but also then terrifying, and like we don't what if we have people who think they're really cops for right. the sexuality and sex acts of the Bible and. Right, yeah, right. That's, they, they feel like that's their job for reasons I don't understand. So. Heather, Caroline, do you have any response to yeah. I mean, this is obviously a really complicated and nuanced issue. I really appreciate what you've been saying, Sam. I, it's worth mentioning for people who aren't aware that some of those passages of scripture are known in the LGBTQ community as the clobber passages <laughs> because yeah. of the damage, right? Mm -hmm. that they've done. And uh, yeah, so that's, you know, that's something to be aware of, that there is harm and hurt associated mm -hmm. with you know, some of those interpretations. And what I would also say is I really love your point, you know, about Dr. Giroux, <laughs> about entering into conversation. And that's something that I think is often a really productive space, right? Um, when I teach the history of gender and sexuality, it becomes immediately evident that positions on, for example, contraception have varied widely across different denominations at different moments in time. And positions on other matters of sexuality also similarly often come with a lot of disagreement. And it shifts the conversa conversation from a space of like, right and wrong into a space of open negotiation and conversation about evolution and change and interpretation. And these are much more productive spaces to be in and they bring us closer together as a Christian community as well when we're having conversations rather than uh, sort of assuming or putting ourselves against one another and trying to find the, the right high moral ground on which to stand and condemn others, right? So I, I've been finding that very productive. And, and that gets back to the, one of the key points I wanted to make, which was, was that you, you just can't do this in the abstract. You, you can't, it's, it's about particular relationships, particular communities with particular people. Um, so if you wanna sort of walk around and say, there's this abstract rule about how you should or shouldn't do sex. And it's like, well, but, but no, no, we, we live out our lives with our bodies and communities and, and contexts and, and, and so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, you know, and, and so, so being able to, to, you know, sort of talk to one another to create spaces where we, we are in relationship already, like, I like you, I trust you, I respect you, and it's mutual, 
um, I don't know everything about you. We don't agree about everything, but we can still be at the table together and we can still talk it through. And, and you know, one of the things when, when I teach sexuality courses here that, that, off, that has happened every time so far is that the students in the class who are the most vocal tend to also be the ones who are the most sort of, um, you know, uh, everything's okay and um, sexual and gender diversity is something to be celebrated and so on. And then I know that there's people in the room who are like, I'm not, I'm not there. That's not what I think about this. And, and, and they're not speaking up either. And it's very complicated, but it's like, well, how, how do we engage? Well, we can only engage if we, we, we've created a community where we can do that. So it's not about reading a textbook. It's, and, and by the way, I think social media is a nightmarish place to have these conversations, <laughs> um, you know, where, you know, people are just going to pop in that you probably barely know, and you're never going to bump into in your everyday life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, it's been really good for people to feel really desperately lonely and isolated, and they're looking for people that they can connect to. So it serves that purpose, but it also ends up being a place where a great deal of harm is done. Because how do you have these kind of tough conversations that are scary for us to have for all kinds of reasons? when we're conversing with people that are virtual strangers to us and that we may never see after you know this gathering or this social media post or whatever no exactly yeah. exactly yeah <laughs> They're basically setting verbal missiles at each other, right? Yeah. So the Bible says this. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Yeah. yeah. All right. Any? Yes. Over there. Hi. Uh, my name is Jessica. I'm actually visiting here from McEwen University. So um, I'm really super excited to be uh, able to be here and uh, have these life changing conversations. So thank you so much for that. Um, I uh, run the Center for Sexual and Gender Diversity on campus at McEwen, and so I get to take a big role in planning Pride Week uh, on, on our campus, and we are collaborating with um, all of the smaller schools in Edmonton this year to offer Pride Week to everyone, and so I'm not sure if you've seen um, any advertising or anything, but all events all week are open to all of our campus communities and members of the public. And one of the best ways to show up for sexual and gender diverse folks is just to show up and listen. So um, we have everything from drag shows to Pride Zumba to um, looking forward to research and um, supporting faculty in creating uh, affirming environments. And those are all on offer. So I really encourage you to take part in them. I have a bit of information I can share. I also have the Edmonton Queer History Map. Um, that's a, it's a new endeavor in Edmonton. It's just being launched tomorrow, actually. And it's, you can, you can take a walking tour and see the places like the Pisces Bathrooms and see where these things are happening. And it's an interpretive guide. We have a very rich queer history in the city of Edmonton. And, um, your institution has played a very huge part <laughs> in its history <laughs> in those conversations. And, um, I think that's something that's really important. So. I don't mean to detract from your presentation. I really, I really enjoyed it. But um, when you're talking about what are those steps that we can take, what is what is actionable now? Um, collaborative processes like the one we're doing for North Side Pride is one of those. None of us is as smart as all of us, right? <laughs> and there are things that um, that knowledge that we can share. So I invite faculty to attend our faculty session tomorrow night to talk. Um, but also, um, just congratulations on opening this conversation on your campus. I uh, think this is really beautiful. So I have some maps and stuff um, and flags and dorky rainbow stuff. Um, just, so I'm just going to put it all on the table here and you can help me. <laughs> well, thanks for coming. It's nice to see you here. Nice to see all the way out. Yeah. yeah. And you brought birth presents. Yeah. <laughs> What's that like? You love swag. <laughs> 
All right, we have a few more minutes. Any more questions? Yeah. So I know this was um, just the start of a conversation and we're continuing to relate them. So I have students, alumni, and churches that come in and ask, what does PMC mean about this topic, these topics? So where do we go next? Mm -hmm. We probably don't know that answer, but where do we go next? How do we have those rich conversations? I mean, uh, one thing I think is it's we have to be careful, I think, about trying to over program some of this stuff, right? Like, I think similar from you talk about on social media, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if we talk about like emotion, like, talk about things that really matter to people, right? If we talk about different levels of emotional intimacy, those aren't conversations you have with just anybody that you're kind of hanging out with in the sports bar or something, right? Like, those are conversations that require trust and levels of consent that you don't have with everybody, right? So you can set up all the forums that you want, but if the forum requires someone to come in and then talk to strangers about this, it's not gonna, I mean, you can do stuff, you can raise awareness, you can do right, some of those kinds of things on a larger programmatic level. Um, but in terms of like how to move forward, at, what, at least one thing I think is just have a conversation about healthy sexuality with someone who's a different generation, right? With a parent, with a child, with, a nephew with a niece, with someone from your youth group at your church, with whoever it is, right? But like, just have those conversations. Um, I mean, right, just one-on-one, -on -one. it's not structural. I mean, there are structural issues that need to be done as well. That's not the structural problem. But I think in terms of the real reflection and radical change, it requires a level of trust that it's gonna be hard to get in an environment like this one, right? That's, that's absolutely true. A lot of times, it does just come down to the chat that you have with someone over a coffee or whatever. But I, I think King's in particular also has an outreach role that we might be able to play. I mean, as Christian scholars, we do our scholarly research, but we also understand it through a particular lens and worldview and perhaps really well positioned to speak out of this institution to different communities. And so that's something that I, admittedly, I'm nervous to do that. Like, I'll be completely honest with you. I'm not always the one jumping to the front of the line to kind of, you know, start those conversations out in public. But I think I could stand to be braver. And maybe many of us could um, play a role in that. And I'm going to be pouncing on you. <laughs> <laughs> one of my side. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, for my sabbatical next year, one of the main thing I want to do is try to find ways to take the stuff that I know as a scholar on these topics and, and um, make it usable by specifically Christian communities of all sorts, schools, churches, um, families, and stuff like that, um, to, to, to facilitate them having a conversation. So not, not like there's tons of great stuff out there. Like, Neil, you talked about there is no good vision of Christian sexuality. Actually, there are people that have produced really beautiful ones. Um, they're just not getting a lot of traction quite yet um, down, down at the ground of people's everyday lived lives. But, you know, we get to sit and read all that scholarly stuff. Most people don't have time and resources to do that. So how do you make that stuff accessible um, in a way that's sort of bite-sized, but not sound bites, not oversimplified, and that, that actually facilitates conversation? I think it's a frighteningly scary task. I cannot totally cannot do that on my own, but I feel like it needs to be done. So I'm going to be dragging people like you guys <laughs> in and saying, you have to help because, um, and any of you out there, if you're going, I have a story or I have a voice or I have a community or I have an experience, very seriously, if you feel able, please talk to me because that would be really, really helpful if, if you know, if, if there's a way that we can bring voices to the table, like, like, you know, Rebecca, when you talked about the fact that there are, you know, concrete instances of really hor horrific bullying and violence against specific students right in this place, um, we don't need to name names, um, but, but we need, do need to tell those stories. And, and, and then ask, have, have people who are having this conversation sit at a table and say, so, is that what it looks like to engage this topic Christianly? And if your answer is no, then how could we do it differently? And how could we make it less likely to happen in the future? So 
So this is a collective process. Um, and, you know, yeah, I, and, and I'm not the person doing it, okay? It's just, it's just, you know, I see that it needs to be done. I want to do one little, uh, contribute to one little piece to it, but we need lots and lots of other pieces to make it a full, rich banquet of stuff. So. Can I just quickly say something? Yeah, Every absolutely. Every has a display of books and resources on the topic of like LGBTQ. And we even have some resources about like God and Christianity and sexuality and issues around that and LGBTQ issues. So if you want to learn more, read more, we have a collection out on display right now. And I would I would say this is probably our 15th year. Yeah. yeah. We have just been plugging away and we're thrilled every year some books get stolen. <laughs> we just replace them. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's just what it costs to do it. And um, I attend a 1000% affirming church, Holy Spirit Lutheran by Southgate Hall. We have a queer pastor. Um, they would talk to any of you anytime. I've speed dialed before. They have been so supportive. To at least, I can think of three students right now um, who came to the library and admitted they were being holy. And we just do what librarians do connect yeah. resources, people, whatever. For what that's worth. Yeah, thank What's you. the name of that? Called Holy Spirit Lutheran. Yeah.